And uh, Darth Vader will be along shortly, but he, like Sir Michael, was delayed because there was a crash on the A2, I think it was. Anyway, we're sorry we're starting late, but we are here, and we've got lots to talk about. Uh, it's very, very good to see so many people here. It's also very good to see so many young people in our audience, because that's why we do these things. Um, for me, the best thing about In Conversation is that I get to meet and talk to in-depth people that I have followed from afar. And tonight, it is Sir Michael Morpurgo, who is one of our best-known storytellers. I think he has written 130 books. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah, a lot. A lot. <laughs> a lot. A, a lot of so, books. Some would say too many. <laughs> Um, uh, the latest ones are When Fishes Flew, Carnival of the Animals, based on uh, obviously a music of the same name, and Song of Gladness. We've all got favorites. War Horse, of course, everybody knows either from the stage or from the book or quite possibly from both. We're going to talk about Michael's work, the process of writing, and I think he's going to sing a song at the end, but we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Shall only, we? only if the doors are closed so they can't leave. <laughs> And I promise I won't join in, because that would really spoil the party. <laughs> um, can, we, can we begin with a, a bit of a biography? I mean, when I looked up your childhood, you moved around a lot, didn't you? You were London, uh, Northumberland, I think. Uh, Northumberland to start with, but then I was evacuated to Northumberland. Ah. Um, uh, I think that's because of V1s or V2s that were falling on London. So 1943, the end of three or 43, I was evacuated up to Northumberland. Don't remember that bit at all. Um, then came back to live in London, went to primary school in London. Then I went to boarding school, lived in Essex on the coast, a place called Bradwell. And then they built an atomic power station um, in the village, and my parents thought, we'll move again. Um, interesting, actually, it was the first time I ever saw or witnessed a row between adults on a mega scale in the village we were in, because there were those who were for the building of it. And um, because they were promised cheap electricity, all the work and labor, there should be for the villagers and stuff, um, none of it worked out. And they built this power station, and I think it operated for about 20 years before it, it just had to be reduced the amount it, of energy it put out. And uh, after that, they've now wrapped it in concrete, and it's there for another 250 <laughs> years. This um, was supposed to be electricity too cheap to meter, I believe, is the... Anyway, the it wrecked our, my childhood because I was very, very happy on the Bradwell coast. I used to go out for walks along um, by a chapel called St. Peter's, which is a very ancient chapel, um, Saxon chapel. Um, and then from my boarding school, I went to school in a dreadful place called Canterbury. Really? <laughs> oh, awful. The traffic's terrible, too. Traffic's terrible. <laughs> the traffic is, but what was really interesting... Yes, I do apologize for being late, by the way. Um, actually, no, it, you were early, you people. That's what's <laughs> anyway, the, tru <coughs> the truth is that Canterbury was um, wonderful in, in those days. I'm sure it's wonderful now, but there wasn't a traffic problem. There was a certain number of people who came who were tourists, but it was in moderation compared to now. However, the glory of the cathedral is still, and the, and the city is still there, and I, I love coming back. I spent five of the most fruitful years of my life there, wore a wonderfully absurd uniform with ring collars and felt frightfully important, <laughs> uh, which I wasn't at all. <laughs> however, there was a however. The however was that when I left that school, uh, I, I like to think, and I think it's achievable in all schools, is that you left that school at that particular time feeling you could do anything. Now, that could be turned quite easily into arrogance, and sometimes is. Um, but I just felt, you know, you... You, you, can, you, you can do stuff. You, you can run around a rugby field. You can sing in a choir. You could write a bit. You could, all sorts of things I, I got to do. I got to act. I got many, many things. They were seeking out your talent. And a lot of us left there thinking, yeah, we can do stuff. And I think that's wonderful for school children to leave school at 17 feeling not the world's their oyster because they've actually got to look after their oyster, as we now know. But um, what's really important is you get that terrific confidence. Yes, I can do this. That's very important. I was very lucky. And you, but you, you went into the army, which was clearly for you a false start, wasn't it? Well, it wasn't false. It was, it was one of those things I did because, well, I was good at being, I don't know how to say this, really. I was very good at the age of 17, but I was a good chap. <laughs> Everyone thought I was a bit of a leader. <laughs> um, and that was a dreadful word, leader, but it meant that people could, 
they listened to me. So I, at school, I was captain of school, which again was very, very bad for your ego. It massaged it far too much. But nonetheless, it gave you the feeling you this confidence that yeah, you could talk to people and they would listen, which was quite useful when I became a teacher later on, actually. Here, so in, <laughs> in Kent? Yes, in Kent, in Wickerbrew, down the road. Um, I, I don't know, it, it was... I don't know, it was one of those times when I just grew and grew and grew. And then I grew into something which other people wanted me to be. I had a stepfather who was very keen on the army. There was a problem at King's at that time, and I think it's the same for many schools, is that people make an assessment of you at a certain age. So I was a good chap, I was a bit of a leader, but a bit dim. <laughs> um, you know, just really a bit dim. And so what do you do? Well, there's the church, the church. Uh, <laughs> I mean that in the nicest possible way. <laughs> or there's the army. Well, I liked, and this sounds pathetic, but I really quite liked dressing up. <laughs> um, and because I guess that wonderful school uniform we all wore, I really loved walking around in that. Um, that was, but it, it was, there was something about going with friends to do what they were doing. And a lot of my chums were going to go to Santos and going to go into the army. So I didn't know what else to do. And I could go on playing rugby. Also, oh. I know it sounds silly, but I love rugby. Yeah. So I went into the army, went to Santos, and, and then the story gets a bit sort of interesting because I, I met my future wife while I was, um, I think I was 19, far too <coughs> young to know better. And um, basically what happened was that she asked me a question, a quite important question. Why are you doing what you're doing? Mm. So that, that was quite hard to answer, because you can't say, well, actually, I really like dressing up. It wouldn't, have <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't have worked. And I just thought to myself, well, why am I doing it? And I started asking myself maybe some serious questions, probably for the first time in my life. And I remember being on exercise outside Camberley, where we had our winter exercise in the winter of 1962. And it was a cold, cold winter. And they sent us all out <laughs> on exercise. Um, into a sort of a I don't know, hinterland that was covered in snow, and we were in slit trenches, and we were told we were going to have to defend the trenches because the enemy, who were the Argyle and Sutherland <laughs> Highlanders, <laughs> um, who were in the trenches opposite, and they could attack during the night or they could attack in the morning. And I remember being in my slit trench with my friends, and the nice, nice young gentlemen from the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders were shouting things at us across. <laughs> No man's land, <laughs> about what they would do to officer cadets if they could get hold of them. <laughs> it was funny, and then I got cold, and then I thought of something, and it was one of those moments. I'm not saying it was on the road to Damascus, but it wasn't far off. I was looking out over this snowy no man's land, and I thought to myself, there was a snowy... No Man's Land in 1914, and there were armies looking at each other across that No Man's Land. And at some point, at various places along the line, soldiers got out of the trenches on both sides. On the place where it happened with the British soldiers, it was the Germans who got out first. And they met in the middle. And they shook hands, and they exchanged gifts, and they played football, and the Germans won. Um, no, they did. <laughs> to, they did to one. I read a letter back from a lieutenant in the German army, which I read. It's absolutely true. I read back to her, his beloved somewhere. I don't know where it was, in Dresden or something. And he wrote back and he said, uh, we had a wonderful Christmas and the most amazing things happened. We climbed out of our trenches and the Tommies climbed out of their trenches and we met in the middle and we put down our coats and we had a football match. And I am pleased to say, <laughs> minor Liebling, that we won two goals to one. <laughs> but the world has not changed that much. <laughs> anyway, so that was it. And I came out of the army then um, because of that conversation, because of what had happened, that sort of realisation, it would be rather more interesting to make peace rather than war with my life. I know that sounds rather heady, but that's what I thought and that's what I still believe. Um, and so got married. Very, very young father, far too young to be sensible. One child, two children another child, and then um, into teaching and university and all that. I went to university in London, another King's. I'm rather fond of King's <laughs> places. Um, but I was a terrible student. Um, I should say this university, I want to confess before I begin, that I'm one of the people that, um, 
a man called Ghosn once said <laughs> um, that people with third class degrees shouldn't be allowed to teach. <laughs> well, that includes me and it includes Philip Pullman. <laughs> so I, did, I did think to myself, wrong. Um, and not saying I was a great teacher, but I loved teaching. I taught um, at the Junior King School and I taught at Wickham Brew Primary School, so I taught in both sectors. And I, I thought this is the place I want to be until I started telling stories to the children and thought, well, I like this better. Now, did you, when you say telling stories, did you <laughs> just simply make them up and, uh, or did you write them beforehand? Did no, you think there, was a, there was a happening, really. The happening was that I had a wonderful head teacher. Some people in the audience might even remember. She was called Mrs. Skippington. <laughs> <laughs> You're joking. <laughs> Who are you? Were you at the school? Did I teach you? Was I brilliant? <laughs> Stand up, I can't see you. <laughs> How nice to meet you. <laughs> anyway, Mrs. <laughs> Skiffington. And, uh, it's wonderful, I'm glad you're there because people will know I don't lie all the time. <laughs> Mrs. Skiffington um, was an extraordinary lady, really. She was a mathematics um, sort of expert, really, in terms of teaching. But I remember she gathered us in this tiny little room, which was called a staff room, but honestly, you could hardly turn around in it. Um, there were only two other teachers. And anyway, one day she came in, and she said, she, she, she was quite sort of grumpy sometimes in the early morning. And she said, um, oh, I, had a, I had an idea in my, in my bath over the weekend and, and, and it's this. I've decided after 36 years of teaching that children learn nothing from three o'clock to half past three. <laughs> They're knackered. Mm -hmm. And we are also knackered. So why do we pretend this, this teaching thing can go on and be useful? I have a much better idea. I want every single teacher to read a story to every single class so there's total quiet. You read the stories, and then she wagged a finger and said, and you do not ask comprehension questions. <laughs> you just read the story, <coughs> and they walk out of that playground with a story in their head. And how wonderful that is, she said, for encouraging a love of stories and the mm. wonder of stories. And, and I knew she was right, but I'd never I'd read the odd story. But we now made it a thing in that school to read from three to half past. And I chose books that I liked because that's how I remember my mother used to read to me and she always read things that she loved and the more you love the thing you read the more you're likely to pass it on I kind of got that so I was reading away a story which I, I, I enjoyed a book and I looked up and all these year sixes there I don't know if you taught year sixes <laughs> hands up if you have well I'm surprised <laughs> you're still here <laughs> I mean, I had 35 year sixes in a mobile classroom, <coughs> which never moves. Did you know that? Mobile classroom. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I, was in, and I, I, would, I was beginning this story, <coughs> chapter one of this story. I won't tell you which it is. The author's now dead, but I don't even wish to, to say who he is. And uh, I told this, I read this story, and I looked up. And year six was doing what year sixes always do when they're just fed up. You know. They have this look on their face. They look in the face of total boredom. And it's a sort of a wish that you were dead. <laughs> so this is the look. This is the look. I will give you the look. This is what year sixes look like when they're hacked off. They go like this. <laughs> <laughs> and it's three o'clock in the afternoon, and you can't blame them, which is why reading this. Anyway, <coughs> the thing is that the idea was to change that, to give them, to tell them a story which would work. And I was telling, reading this story, and I found it wasn't working. So they were still... <laughs> picking their noses and picking <laughs> And so I went back to my wife, who's here tonight, who's also a teacher, and um, trained at Christchurch. And um, she said, well, they're bored. Why are you reading them a story that bores them? Any child who is bored is going to look out the window and pick their nose. What's your problem? <laughs> and so I said, well, what am I going to do? I've just started this book. I can't abandon it. She said, of course you can. There's no point in going on boring children. That's not what you're there for. <laughs> she said, why don't you tell them a story of your own. And I said, you've got to be joking. They're year sixes. They'll kill me. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And she said, no, come down here, you could do it. You're quite a good liar. You could do this sort of thing. <laughs> so I lay there that night. I thought about it. And I thought, well, you've, got to be, you've got to screw the courage to the sticking place. You've got to try, try. So I read up, made up the story, went in there the next day. Three o'clock came around. And I told the story out loud to these year sixes. And it's quite true. The first five minutes, it was uh, they didn't like it. And I thought, I tried even harder. Gave it all the welly I could give it. And I suddenly saw the wonderful, the faces change. It went from to this what? <laughs> Five minutes later, ten minutes later, I had them. <laughs> and at half past three, this is the best bit, half past three, the bell went... And what went round the classroom was the best sound I ever heard in the classroom. Oh, no, sir. <laughs> and I thought, yes! <laughs> and then it, every teacher here will know that there's nothing better <coughs> than when something works in a lesson. We have plenty of the opposite. <laughs> Sorry, I whittled on, but there we are. I think we should get your wife up, actually. She's given you two life lessons, and we've only been talking for about 10, 15 minutes. Um, Look, we've got a lot of questions from the audience. Some mm. have already come in, mm. but I know you want to read a story. So read us a story, and let's have a look and see if the audience is... I shall, <laughs> I shall look up and see how many pick their noses. <laughs> Listen, this I tell you... year six. I the would, reason I, I wanted to <coughs> read you a story, and this, by the way, is a more beautiful book um, illustrated by a wonderful illustrator called Emily Gravitt, and it's called A Song of Gladness. And the reason I'm reading it to you is that all of us have been through stuff in the last two years, all of us, um, of one sort or another. And when it happened, I was at home in Devon. I was much luckier than a lot of people. I had a garden to walk out into, and indeed a farm. We could walk out and walk along the river. There was, and I didn't complain about wonderful neighbours who looked after us because they thought we were old, <laughs> which is quite untrue. <laughs> anyway, but I did have cause to be sad because <coughs> my best friend at university had died. And as you know, when, when someone dies who's your own age, it kind of makes you sit up and take note. And also you know how much you miss them suddenly because you've grown up with them. And um, so I was sad. I would go out every morning, and I still do this when I'm at home, um, to the vegetable garden, which is right by our little cottage down this little Devon Lane, which leads down to a, a river called the Torridge, which is very famous for an otter called Tarka. Um, so it's very remote and a tiny, tiny little garden with a bit of a vegetable garden. And I pick kale every morning. There is a good reason for this. Um, I had an illness not long ago, uh, uh, a little cancer, and uh, I was told afterwards by a dear friend of mine who'd also heard this wretched thing, said, fine, 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 you've done all the right things and it's all good, but... To survive, you must eat kale. <laughs> so I loathe kale. Um, I didn't know what to do, but she said, no, 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 it's quite palatable <coughs> if you make it into a smoothie each morning. So I would go out each morning to the vegetable garden. I'd pick some kale and some mint and, s and some cucumber and um, maybe a half a pear or something and make a smoothie for Claire, my wife, and myself. And um, it became a sort of complete routine. So I would go out early morning in my pyjamas with my wellies on wonderful sight, <laughs> and um, go to the vegetable garden and pick some kale. And I was out there one morning when a blackbird started to sing on a branch, I don't know, just, just the other side of a hedge, really. And I saw the blackbird and listened to the song, and I just had this strange feeling that he was singing for me. All right, it sounds absurd, but it isn't. I think many, many of us had these moments <coughs> during this last time when we felt closer to the world about us, to how the seasons change. And we just had the time to be still and quiet, and the song sounded more beautiful than I'd ever heard a, a, a bird's song before. And he seemed to be doing it with such enthusiasm, you know. So I sang back, whistled back, actually, exactly imitating him. So he would go... <laughs> so I would go... <laughs> there was a bit of a pause, and he'd go... So I would go, and he went, and 
I thought, this is fun. <laughs> and it went on a bit, and I thought then something a bit serious. I thought, this is a conversation, which he's enjoying as much as I am. So I went in, and the next day I came out to the same thing, and he was waiting for me, singing away. So on we went with our conversation. I was very moved by it. I was very touched by it. And then I thought it meant something more significant. Um, and because of the way of the world and how I felt, I sat down and I wrote this, the Song of Gladness. I've been talking every morning to Blackbird, telling him why we are all so sad. He sits on his branch and listens. It was Blackbird's idea. He sang it out this morning at dawn from his treetop in the garden to Fox half asleep behind the garden shed. She thought it a good idea, too. It was a wake-up call. Fox was on her feet at once and trotting through Bluebell Wood where she barked it to Deer, who ran off across the stream. Kingfisher was there, Otter and Dipper, too. They heard and piped it on, and Swallow swooped down over the meadow and passed it on to cows, waiting to go into their milking, and to sheep resting quietly under the hedge with her lambs in the corner of the dew-damp field. And they all agreed, bleating it out to bees already busy at their flowers, to weaving spiders and grasshoppers and scurrying mice. Trees were listening to all the trees, waving their budding leaves in wild enthusiasm. High above in the skies, clouds gathered, driven by wind. And wind took Blackbird's idea over the cliffs, across heaving seas, where gulls and albatross cried it out, and whales and, wolfins, and, and dolphins and porpoises heard it, and wailed and whooped it down into the deep where turtles listened. And they too loved the idea, so did plankton, and every fish and crab and sea urchin and whelk they all whispered that it was a fine notion, the best they ever heard. In rivers, salmon and sea trout leapt for joy to hear it. Eagles, soaring above on wide wings, flew over the mountains, crying it out loud. And the echoes were heard deep in the dens below, where slumbering bears listened, lost in their dreams of spring. They snored and grunted their approval, even in their sleep. Snows melted at the thought of it, and the whole wonderful idea flooded down the mountain streams and far out to sea where the tide took it and carried it over the sea on curling waves to distant shores, to parched plains where lions roared their approval and elephants trumpeted it, leopards yawned it, water buffalo belched it, wild dogs yelped it, and wildebeest, wildebeest murmured it out across the wide savannah. Then storm lifted the idea up over rainforests, where rain took it and poured it down on gorillas in the mist, on chimpanzees in their sleeping nests. And Crocodile swished his tail in his swamp and clapped his great jaws shut, smiling at the very thought of it. Howler monkeys and gibbons echoed their calls, loud over all the earth they are, that loud. And then from far up high, sun heard it too and shone it down over deserts where Oryx stamped her foot, impatient to be getting on with it and doing it. She loved the idea that much. Even Camel, who rarely joined in anything, thought this was the best and most beautiful idea he had ever heard. Back in the garden, Blackbird waited till everyone was ready and then he began to sing. The whole carnival of animals heard him, and every living thing on this good earth joined in until the glow echoed with the joy of it. And Blackbird was very pleased, but I was still lost in sadness as I heard the earth singing around me. It was a song of forgiveness. I knew that. So I asked Blackbird if I was allowed to join in, and he sang his answer back to me. My friend, why do you think we are doing this? We want you and yours to be happy again. Only then will you treat us and the world right as you know you should. Only then will all be well. 
Just sing, my friend. Sing our song. It's your song. Your song. It's our song. So I sang it. We all sang. Sang away our sadness. In every house and flat and cottage we clapped and sang. In every shelter and tent. In every school and palace and hospital and prison. And they heard and we heard our song of gladness echoing about us in glorious harmony across the universe. <laughs> I bet that took you two back. <laughs> well, I'm glad you were not still in the trenches worrying about uh, being in the army. I, uh, that is beautiful, obviously. Um, one of the things that strikes me about your work is that you recognize that animals humanize us. Yep. They, they humanize the best of us. They get the best out of us. War horse is one example as well, and uh, you know, the most awful circumstances, yeah. and in this too. And that's really important to you, isn't it? How, we, how the natural world is treated. Yes, them. and then the effect, they, the effect they have on us. And I suppose it is that, I mean, I like all kids, I like animals, and I, when I grew up, I had a dog which I adored, which had to be sold because it was a bit wild. And I was very sad about that. And my parents replaced it with a goldfish. <laughs> 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 it didn't somehow do the trick. But to be serious, um, this is something else I owe my wife. My wife grew up with um, a profound love of the countryside. This is because her, her daddy, who was a great man, a great publisher, a man called Alan Lane, who started Penguin Books, he decided at some point that she was really a bit of a nuisance at home, I think. She was kind of a, a girl who knew her own mind. And he caught her back on it. <laughs> anyway, at some point, um, they went down to Devon, in the village where we now live, which is very strange. And uh, he took Claire down there. And they stayed in a pub where his old friend of <coughs> his who lived, lived there, and Auntie Peggy, she was known as. And at one point, he said to her, look, Claire really likes the countryside. And she was a bit bored at home. And would it be all right if she came down and spent two weeks with you each holiday? And uh, an arrangement happened. And so for two weeks, holiday after holiday, from the age of about seven to the age of about 12, I think, she came down and stayed in this pub. And Auntie Peggy was sweet and didn't mind her at all, but wanted her out of the house. And so I said to her every morning, get your wellies on. And she had to go out for a walk, age seven, into the... Um, what Ted Hughes called the deep lanes of Devon, great high, high hedges. And she'd walk down these lanes and she'd walk up farmers' tracks and meet the farmer and she'd feed the sheep and the sheep groom the horses and became a little country farm girl for two weeks of her life. And it was the happiest time of her life without any question. And she held that in her head all the way through her um, youth and... Um, then, luckily for her, she met me. <laughs> and I was a teacher, she was a teacher, and both of us decided something, I thought, which, which changed our lives, which was this, that you can teach only so much in a school, no matter how good a teacher you are, or indeed how good the school is, that a lot of the learning has to be done outside the school, at home. Yes, mm -hmm. parents, of course, are the main teachers there, and family. But many children don't get, necessarily, the parents who help with that, the homes that help with that not necessarily the fault of the parents, it's the circumstances in which many people have to live their lives, and the children, therefore, have a narrower education. And her idea and my idea, mostly hers, was that if you got these kids out of school, and for a week of their young lives, you took them to the countryside, and they lived and they worked, as she had done, um, you were, your eyes would open to the world about you. You'd feel connected to it. You'd, the care for it would grow and grow and grow, and how important that was to them. So for 25 years of our life, we worked with these children on the farm. About a 1,000 of them a year would come down to the farm, and we'd work with them. So I was in this really privileged position to work alongside children who were seeing animals close up for the first time. And you saw <coughs> the mutual effect, beneficial effect, this was happening. Um, the, the calm 
that came over the animals when the children um, were there as they weren't shrieking and shouting, which they never did because we kind of told them that it was a good idea to be reasonably calm. And actually they were naturally more calm around them. They seemed to have this connection, much more natural connection than I ever had with it. And so they would hold out their hand gently to whether it was a cow or it was to a horse or whatever. There was fear sometimes. They got over that pretty quick, much quicker than I have said with some of the teachers. When they're feeding pigs, it was very obvious that the teachers wanted to stand back just a little. <laughs> and the children were right in there. Anyway, this went on and went on. And what you saw was this connection. Um, it was rather like the connection with water. If children could learn to swim very young, there's no fear. Now, that was what was happening, what was happening. And there were one or two instances that really taught me that this is a mutual thing. And the most important one, which was enabled me to write War Horse, um, was coming in. I used to go and read to the kids each Thursday evening before they went home. Uh, on the Friday morning, and I'd walk into the yard at this big Victorian house, which is sort of a bit like Hogwarts, and um, there's a yard behind, a stable yard, and we had a horse there, a halflinger called Phoebe, who was much loved by the children, and uh, would be in the stable always next to the back door that the children came out of. And there was a boy there who had come from Birmingham but in the 1970s, and he was 10, and we'd been told, look, when Michael... When you're with Billy, do not do what you normally do with children and point your finger at him and ask him a question and expect an answer. You won't get one. It'll frighten him. He doesn't speak. And anyone that encourages him to speak or makes him speak in any way, shape or form, he runs away. He's been known to run away from school a lot, and I, we don't want him running away from Devon to Birmingham. It's a long way. So could you just not ask him any questions at all? He won't speak. He doesn't, hasn't spoke. He's been two years in the school. He's never spoken to anyone. Anyway, so I didn't. I just observed Billy, as uh, the teachers had done all week, and he was brilliant with the animals. Totally silent with them, but brilliant. And so he was always the first to put his hand under a hen to pick up the eggs warm. And he'd hold them in his hand, and he'd wonder at the warmth, I think. You could see a lot of wonder in his face all the way through the week. But no words at all. And that last Thursday night, I went up to read. It was dark. It was November. Walked into the yard. It was drizzling rain, and he was stood there in the back step in his pyjamas and slippers, but with the rain coming down. And I was about to say, Billy, get back inside. And, and then I saw he was holding his hand out, and he was stroking Phoebe's neck. And I stood there for a moment to watch, and then he started talking. <laughs> Nineteen to the dozen, he was talking to this horse. A lot of hesitancy, because a lot of people thought it was a stammer he was covering up, or a stutter, therefore that was why he wouldn't speak. The words flowed, telling his horse all about what he'd done the day, that day on the farm. So I went and got the teachers, and we all came back and we hid in the darkness behind the building. And we listened to him. He just talked, talked, talked. And then I noticed something that was just as special, which was the response of the horse. Um, the horse was not just standing there being stroked. The horse was remaining there, um, not because... Billy had any food, but because the two obviously had a lot of respect and affection for each other. And that horse knew that it was part of the relationship to stand there and be there with Billy. And he liked Billy. He loved Billy. I said, surely she is the she he is. And I was so touched by that, by the fact that it was a two-way thing, which has enabled me to write a book where the horse tells a story without it being ridiculous or sentimental. And I've always felt that it was before then and since. I felt that this is a very profound relationship we have with nature. And during this last lockdown, I felt it more than ever. I mean, that blackbird was, was not a joke. You know, I really do feel deep down that I have a connection with that blackbird. Um, I made a story of it. Do you know what I did? I went and I read that story to the blackbird in the garden. He really appreciated it. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I just think there's this connection and we've forgotten about it. We're simply part of the same creation. Now, whether you believe that to be a God creation or, or uh, some other kind, it doesn't matter. What matters is that we're all here on this earth. We're trying to share it together. We do that extremely badly because we don't like sharing. That's becoming very opposite. And the animals and the birds are the ones that suffer. I feel this very, like many people do, very profoundly. And um, that's why I write a book. Um, 
we've got a, a bit of time left. Perhaps we can bring up the house lights a bit and we can get some questions from the audience, particularly our younger members of the audience, but anybody uh, who would like to ask a question. And I'll do my best to see those of you in the outer darkness because <laughs> it's not always easy. So just stick up your hand if you wouldn't mind. And we've got a boom mic. So who would like to go first? Yes, there's somebody there. Uh, I'm really passionate about creative writing. Do you have any tips? Who was asking this question? Ah, I just heard a s still small voice, but I didn't see. <laughs> Do I have any tips? Do you write already? Um, yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Poetry, stories, what? Um, stories. Yeah, me too, mostly. <laughs> um, Do I have any tips? It's really hard, that question because every writer is different and should be different because we all have our own voice, our own way of seeing the world and our own way indeed of expressing ourselves and therefore of writing. So I think what's really important is to do the following. Are you paying attention? <laughs> <laughs> do a lot of reading. That's really important. The more you drink in other people's words and other people's ideas and they soak into you, that's really important. So that's the first thing. I don't care if it's the back of a cornflakes packet. Read it. <laughs> then, once a day, if you can, just write down a couple of lines, no more, about the best and most important, saddest, funniest thing that's happened that day. And don't let a day go by without writing those two lines. Write them in a book. This book is secret. It's your book. You don't need to share it with anyone at all. And you just write those two lines down. The reason it's a good idea, and I try to do it, I fail mostly these days, but I used to do it when I was younger. The important thing really is to get used to writing. The thing is, we're much more used to speaking. Right? Now, when I'm speaking to you now, I do not know what word I'm going to use next. And I will stumble over it. And I won't be able to spell it. I'm just telling you the thoughts that are in my head. Okay? When you're writing, it's that process that you have to, you have to be so relaxed you just tell the story down. Next thing, you have to keep your ears open and your eyes open and your heart open and be aware of the world around you more and more and more. Go places, talk to people, listen to people, hear what they think, fill your head with this stuff of life, really, because that is what you're going to be using. Finally, at the end of the day, what writers use mostly is the memory they've built up from very, very little, before they even knew they had a memory, to a very old age. You just build it up, and it becomes this encyclopedia of ideas and notions. And then, when you are really keen to write a story that you want to write, not because someone's told you to write it, something you want to write, um, the idea will have come from something, something you've heard on the <coughs> back of a bus. Some friend of yours who's poorly, Anything that's touched your heart, that's made you interested, that can be the beginning of a story. And a story within grows. Don't write it quickly. Don't think I must do this very quickly and become J.K. Rowling tomorrow. <laughs> All right? It really won't happen. What you need to do is to let it soak in. And when you're ready, really ready, you know the people in the story, you know the places in the story, then you get your book. And I use the books that I steal from primary schools I visit. They're, no, they're really wonderful. They j I have to tell you, I brought one to show you. <laughs> Do we all recognize these? Yeah. Why are they orange? What is it about orange, for goodness sakes? Anyway, um, no, I give them sometimes in schools that I visit. And they, do you know what's wonderful about them? It's really important. They've got really small pages, which means that when you fill up a page, you feel very good very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really important because you've got to feel satisfaction as you're writing it. <coughs> and when you've finished a page or finished two pages, then read it out loud, not to anyone else, to yourself, and make your own corrections. Do not worry about the spelling. Do not worry about the punctuation. Not at this stage. That's for later. It's very important later on because if you don't write it properly with punctuation, no one's going to be able to understand it. Full stops are important. If you don't put full stops, <laughs> people can't breathe. Do you understand? <laughs> put them there. But... Seriously, whilst you're telling the story, 
just tell the story down, okay? And forget the rest of the world, just tell it. And then when you're a huge success, don't you dare come signing books in a bookshop I know. <laughs> Any more, any more thoughts? Please wave your hand. There's, th yes, a couple down here. Go, go ahead. What's the best way to get your first book published? Best way to get your first book published. Who said that? <laughs> you little merchant. Young lady you. over there. <laughs> um, there isn't a best way. There really isn't. Just, you, just be contented writing a book, OK? <laughs> the, the other stuff will follow on. Honestly, I'm, I'm, I'll be a little bit serious. It, it's really important that it's not for you just the beginning of a pathway. A story is simply a story, and it's your story. Write it, be contented with it, write the next one, and when, if later on you think, this is, I really want to do this, I don't want to study English, or I want to write for a living, that's fine. Then what you do, and actually I got lucky, I spoke to someone I worked with, Mrs. Skiffington. <laughs> uh, she had a friend who worked in a publishing house called Macmillan. <laughs> and when I wrote a story, which she came into the class and listened to, one of the stories that I was telling to children, and she thought, oh, it's really good. She said, very good, Michael. You should write it out and give it to me on Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, and she had a friend. I mean, this is what happens. It's someone you know. It's quite good if you do know someone, not because it's sort of, that's a good idea particularly, but it, it, it's people will notice the, the script that comes in. It's so-and-so's little friend but someone will read it, and that's good. So go to Wickham Brew Primary School. <laughs> <laughs> that's the avenue for, to be a writer. <laughs> yes, there's somebody else there. Yeah. I sometimes write stories that are stop halfway through because they never amount to anything if I don't finish them, essentially. Join the club. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Every writer there's ever been, I promise you, has said exactly what you've just said at some stage or other. N that's the truth. I bet there were many plays that Shakespeare began he didn't <laughs> go on with. <laughs> the truth is that you can't be sure it's going to work out the way you, you think it will work out. What you have to do is to keep going. You must not be put off by the fact. I was told something which I will pass on to you by a man I was lucky enough to get to know, a man called Ted Hughes, who was a decent enough writer. <laughs> and <laughs> Ted Hughes said to me once, he lived down the lane from us at home, so I got to know him that way. He was a lovely man and a great, very good with young writers. And he did say to me at some point, because I was having trouble in the middle of War Horse, exactly the same problem you're having. I don't see it going anywhere. I can't finish it. Da, 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 da. And he pointed at me, as I'm pointing at you. He said, well, you shouldn't have started it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I then wanted an explanation for that cruel remark. And he said, well, the truth is, you have to spend days, weeks, months dreaming it out in your head. And you don't start putting pen to paper or whatever you do with the machine until it really is in your head that you so much want to get it out that it will come out. And don't have a plan, because the plan always goes wrong. Don't stick to a plan. He says, know your people, know the places, soak yourself in it, and then when you write it, focus on what you're telling. And then he said something which I'm saying to you which is really important. Whatever you do, don't stop halfway. Because what happens if you stop halfway is exactly the question you just asked me. You lose confidence about beginning the next one. Whatever you do, you finish, and you put a full stop, and you read it, and you take the satisfaction from it that you can, or you read it to your mum, or you read it to your best friend, or whatever. But it's done, it's finished, and you put it in a drawer, and then you start another one. But whatever you do, don't stop in the middle and say, I can't, because that little thing saying, I can't, um, can kill the storyteller in you. You understand what I'm saying? Don't take it from me, take it from Ted Hughes. Do you understand? <laughs> <laughs> Some more questions. Anybody over this side? Yes, lots over here, so just to make you move a bit faster. Who, who have we got? Some, somebody over there, and then there's some, somebody, a couple of people in the corner. Go ahead.
Shout out. Yeah, go ahead. No, it's fine. Shout out. What book, what are you book most am I proud most of? proud of? I'm not proud of any of them. <laughs> um, no, it's a good question. Do you know it's a word I sort of, I really dislike, proud. People are always saying, I'm very proud of my performance on the football pitch today. Excuse me? You know, you sh it should be, I enjoyed my performance on the football pitch today. The proudest moments I have if you're asking about the, what the word proud really means to me, is what makes me feel good deep inside, is if I get a letter from someone your age, but nicer than you. <laughs> well, you've never written me a letter, have you? Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> if you write a letter to me, and you've written a letter which says, Miss so-and-so was reading the butterfly lion to us the other day in our class. And she couldn't finish it because she was so upset and moved by it. And I got to finish it. And I loved it. Full stop. The notion else, that, that we're, we're like this, all of us. The notion that someone else loves what you do is, is wonderful, really wonderful. Doesn't that be writing? But with writing, the opportunities for that to write are enormous because you do not know all the people who read your books. I get letters from China. Never been to China. Can't speak Chinese. But a Chinese child writes in their in the best English a letter which is a letter of appreciation for something. Now, if I understand what you mean by the word proud, I think maybe that makes me feel good. Not good opposite to bad, but just good inside. Do you understand? It's a good question, though. It's just a bit awkward. <laughs> Thank you. So there was somebody else up there. Yep. Go ahead. Could could you say it again a little bit louder? Could you put the microphone a little bit closer to me? I know we shouldn't, but um, I've got to be able to hear it. When I'm writing a book, I got that bit. I am very old and very deaf, so speak up. <laughs> yes. For me, the best stories I read make me go away thinking, what have I just been reading here? What's this been about? Wondering about it, uh, rather than a happening which is supposed to somehow uh, shock you or surprise you. So don't be too concerned over, over that. Okay? End, it, end the story the way you feel the story ends naturally. Don't impose anything on it. It's got its own way of telling itself out. All stories have. I mean, that story I just read to you about the blackbird, I didn't sit down and say, how can I finish this story? It sort of emerged naturally from the way I was writing it. I think it's what it is, you know. I think I think it's it's something we sometimes impose on ourselves how stories ought to be. Well, don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got time for one more question. Uh, there's down at the front. Yes, go ahead. We can hear you. Um, one of my favourite books from the Britain Open Teaching Program. Yes. My question for you is, um, what was your inspiration for the book, The Pride Packet? Um, Kensky's Kingdom. Not Kensuke's kingdom. No, it's all right. Everyone gets it wrong, including me. I thought it was Kensuke, but a Japanese person told me, and they should know, it's Kensuke. Okay? And the question was? Um, what gave you the inspiration to write the book? The, what inspiration, you the inspiration to write the book. Okay. Um, let me get this right in order, because it was some time ago that I wrote it, but I'm going to try and tell you why I wrote Kensuke's kingdom. I think the first thing that happened was that I read a story in a newspaper. I very often get my stories originally from a newspaper or from history. This is a story about a Japanese soldier left behind on an island in the Coral Islands um, after the Second World War. 
He wasn't, strictly speaking, left behind. He decided to stay behind because he, wanted, he refused really to believe that the war was over and that his side had lost. So he stayed there and he was alone. And this is remarkable. He was there for 24 years. There were three of them. This is the longest one. 24 years on his own on an island. And I'm thinking when I read that, that's about 20 more years than Robinson Crusoe. And how extraordinary. And I was thinking how, how I would have liked to have met someone like that, who had done that. And he was picked up. And he was taken back to Japan, where he became an MP in Japan. But there was a whole other story afterwards. And I think what, it, what I read was his obituary, is when he died. And I just thought this was a very beautiful story in many ways. And he'd lived alone on this island. And then I thought, what, I, what would bring this story alive for me would be to have some kind of way of getting onto that island, me, getting onto that island. Well, how could I do that? Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. But any oh, yes, as I said to myself, didn't work. And then I went, actually, it was in Kent to a drinks party. <laughs> now, I will explain to you what will happen in the rest of your life. Your whole education is designed, really, so that you can go to drinks parties and hold your own. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Forget the GCSEs, the A-levels. It's just about drinks parties. <laughs> anyway, I went to a drinks party, was not holding my own at all. Um, as I very often, I, I, I don't really like lots of noise and lots of questions, so I said to my wife, Claire, I, I, I want to go home. But she was really happy at a drinks party. <laughs> she usually is. So I went, and <laughs> I went and sulked by a door, waiting for her to come. And she didn't, and she didn't. And this man came up to me and started talking. And he was really boring, <laughs> which most people are at drinks parties, <laughs> until he started. Um, I asked the question. It's really sad. I asked the question. Which all people who've been to such great schools and great university, myself, to ask an original question would be good. But I didn't have an original question. I said, so what do you do? <laughs> it's that sad. And he said, well, actually, I don't, I don't do anything. And I thought, this, he truly is very, very boring, this man. <laughs> and then he went on, and it was brilliant. He said, well, actually, I lost my job about I don't know, six, seven years ago. And I was feeling very depressed and suddenly this was turning into something I hadn't expected. And he said, and I didn't know what to do. And my wife said to me, look, maybe it's a moment to make something really wonderful of. Why, why do we not do what it is we've always wanted to do? And so the husband said, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? I said, well, you know, you know, we've always talked about this sailing around the world. We've always wanted to sail around the world, get a boat and sail around the world. And he said, that's what I've been doing. So this boring man <laughs> was telling me he'd sailed around the world. I said, how long have you gone? He said, five years. <laughs> and I said, did you by any chance pass by the Coral Sea? He said, yes. We got off on many islands. We went to New Zealand. We've done this. We've done that. And then I asked him a question. I said, um, did you go alone, just you and, you and your wife? He said, no. And our son? And I'm thinking, boy, island, good, but not quite good enough. Just the three of you then? He said, no. And a dog? <laughs> it just got better and better and better. So I'm thinking... In, I, there, standing, listen to this man, I'm thinking, ship, yacht, whatever you might call it. Um, the boy's at the wheel. He's 12 years old. Mum's down below, she's poorly. Dad's down below looking after. 
the ship takes a turn. And he's in the sea, swimming, swimming, swimming. And the dog's in there as well, swimming, swimming. And he's thinking, sharks, sharks, sharks. And then he's swimming, swimming, swimming. And there's an island. So this boy from England is washed up on an island and has to share this island with um, a Japanese soldier from another time, an ancient warrior from many, many decades ago from the east, a small boy from the west, and they have to share this paradise of an island and look after each other. How would that work out? So it really asks the question, how would they get on? And do you know, it's funny you ask me that question because this afternoon I was in a studio in London where they are making a, an animated full-length feature film of the first I've seen of it. I just saw the first half, um, which is going to be out of this world brilliant. It's written by a man called Frank Cotrevoice, who wrote the script, and just the most marvellous, marvellous drawings. I think it's going to come out in 2023. So I've got Kensky in my head, and so when you ask that question, I thought, well, I'm going to make you go to the cinema, so at least <laughs> <laughs> one person will buy a ticket. <laughs> Why do, why do you think writers like me quite like it when people buy their books or buy tickets to their plays or their films? What do you think the reason is we like that? And we like to talk about it. What's the reason? If you were honest, look me in the eye and tell me what it is. <laughs> what do you think the reason is? You're too nice. It's money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've got to have our pensions, right? It's important, I'll tell you what it is. I'm going to tell you something now. It's really important. You remem must remember this when you see a writer. Every writer, of course, we love our stories and we love our poems and so forth. Aren't we clever and stuff? But actually, we really need more sock. <laughs> That's all. So you're going to go into Waterstones or whatever bookshop it is and you'll, you'll look on the line and you'll see David Williams <laughs> and you'll see Roald and you'll see J.K. Rowling and you'll see Philip Pullman and then you see Michael Moore Pingo. <laughs> Buy Michael Moore Pingo's book. <laughs> because they have masses of pairs of socks. All those people I mentioned. And these ones have got holes in already. <laughs> we, we are unfortunately coming out of time. And I know that you want to end on a song. Well, the reason I'm ending on a song is because there's this wonderful tradition, isn't there? You've got to sing for your supper. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have supper afterwards. <laughs> isn't that nice? So, no, it's not that. It's just that I, I like to finish on a sort of different note, really. Um, this is a book which um, is the only book I've ever written alongside my wife. It's, it says Claire and Michael, or Pingo, or Flamingo, whatever you like to call it. And um, this is a story of her being down on the farm when she was little. And we made it into a poetry anthology, which we love doing with a wonderful illustrations by a, ma a woman called Olivia Lomenich Gill. And in it, there is a ballad, a song, which um, you will have heard before if you saw the play of War Horse, which I know came to the Marlowe Theatre. Could you put up your hands, anyone who saw the play? Higher? That's not enough, Canterbury. <laughs> Put your hands down. Um, I came to see it at the Marlowe myself, and it was great there. Anyway, some of you will remember folk songs weave their way through the whole story of War Horse, which, which was wonderful. And this is one of the songs. So I thought I'd, because it's winter, it's, um, it's very important, actually, just for the moment. It's a song really about renewal and the hope of uh, new life and new spring which we kind of all need at the moment. You'll forgive my... I'm the kind of singer who sings in the bath, <laughs> though I was, I have to say, in the choir when I was at uh, the King's School, and, um, but I was an inferior member. <laughs> Here it is. <coughs> I think I'll stand up. It's better for you all. It's called Barley Corn. Cruel winter cuts through like the reaper. The old year lies withered and slain. 
and like barley corn who rose from the grave a new year will rise up again and the snow fall the wind call the year turns round again and like barley corn who rose from the grave a new year will rise up again and I'll wager a hat full of guineas against all of the songs you can sing that someday you'll love and the next day you'll lose and winter will turn into spring ploughed, sown, reaped and mown the year turns round again and like barley corn who rose from the grave a new year will rise up again I will garland a bonnet of daisies to crown you the queen of the May and all shall behold the seasons unfold as surely as night follows day Phoebe arise her gleam in her eyes the year turns round again and like barley corn who rose from the grave a new year will rise up again and there will come a time of great plenty a time of good harvest and sun till then put your trust in tomorrow my friend for yesterday's over and done and the snow fall the wind call the year turns round again and like barley corn who rose from the grave a new year will rise up again. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. <clears throat> Thank you all very much. Uh, Please keep the letters rolling in for Michael, <laughs> and he'll be back next year perhaps to just check on the progress. We'll see. Just like that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.